said, my name is Stacy Stocks. Um, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Stacy Stocks. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I have been practicing for about 25 years and some change. Um, thank you so much, Debbie, for kind of um, arranging this. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen in a moment, and then I'm going to kind of turn my camera off just so that you guys can kind of take in the material and not have to look at my terrible background back there. Um, but it's so nice to see there's people from all over the place. There's Oregon and Tennessee and LA, so, and, uh, you know, Tucson and Lake Havasu. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so like I said, um, uh, I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time with you today, really kind of talking about mindfulness kind of and its uses in clinical practice. So I am going to share my screen. All right, and I am going to, give me one second, there we go. All right, so I hope, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I hope that you all can kind of see the presentation and we'll go ahead and kind of get started. Um, so as I mentioned, um, what I wanted to maybe do today is just really provide you all with a brief introduction really to the concept of mindfulness, um, its benefits, um, how to practice, and maybe kind of most importantly, how we can maybe start to integrate um, this skill kind of into our clinical practice. Um, and um, as I mentioned, um, I have been practicing about uh, 25 years. Um, I have worked in traditional behavioral health settings but also in integrated uh, behavioral health uh, settings. And um, I'm so happy to be kind of joining um, as a clinical director to LA Mental Health here in the West Valley. Um, we actually are hoping to open our first clinic um, in the next few months. So I'm very, very much looking forward to that uh, adventure. Um, so I really just kind of wanted to start with just kind of the basics, right? You know, kind of what is mindfulness? And so I'd say probably in the last 20, 25 years kind of in psychology, um, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of talk about kind of mindfulness. So you all may know a whole lot about this, but I just kind of wanted to maybe start with a few ways of thinking about it, it, it as a construct, maybe as a concept. And so um, really to start, you know, one way to think about mindfulness, is kind of the, the basic human ability for us to really be fully present, kind of aware of maybe where we are, what we may be doing while not becoming overly maybe reactive or overwhelmed kind of by what maybe is happening around us, right? Um, also too, when we think about mindfulness, it's really the willingness to be able to experience oneself, kind of our thoughts, maybe our feelings, our bodily sensations, kind of in, and one's life maybe just as it is, right? Um, another way of kind of thinking about it is just, again, this practice of creating space between maybe what your mind says works and uh, what your experience says kind of works and matters. Um, again, as a practice, uh, mindfulness teaches us how to be able to kind of return to and really remain in the present moment um, kind of by anchoring ourselves kind of uh, into the present without experiencing judgment, right? And then finally, um, gives us really the chance um, to really observe maybe our initial reactions, like I said, you know, bodily reactions, maybe thoughts and feelings without maybe becoming hooked or overwhelmed by them. Um, so certainly uh, mindfulness has been around for a very long time. Um, it is essentially the building blocks of a number of Eastern philosophies and practices such as Buddhism, yoga, things like that. Um, and so even though kind of here in Western uh, psychology, we've kind of just, like I said, in the last maybe 20, 25 years kind of um, embraced it, um, you certainly don't need to be a practicing Buddhist or a yogi in order to kind of you know, gain you know, its benefits. Um, just before we kind of move on, maybe any uh, initial thoughts, questions so far? Okay, all right. So I wanted to also kind of take just a moment or two really to kind of talk about its benefits, right? And there's been a lot of research that really validates kind of time and time again, kind of the benefits of mindfulness. And so kind of what I think of is kind of the body, mind and spirit, right? So initially, and what we can, what we can say, even though we're gonna talk most about kind of some of the emotional and psychological benefits, um, research does show uh, that practicing mindfulness improves things like physical health and well-being, right? 
um, again, it can help us to kind of cope with or manage or re reduce the perception that we have of pain. Um, and certainly kind of what we, what we know about pain is that while pain is certainly physical discomfort that we feel in our, our physical body, oftentimes it's our perceptions about the pain that we're experiencing that's what, that is what causes us the suffering, right? So again, kind of mindfulness is a way to help us be able to kind of reduce the perception of pain um, to be able to help us cope with it more effectively. Um, again, research also shows that um, practicing mindfulness helps to improve things like our immune functioning. Um, and it can also help us be able to kind of cope with or reduce symptoms of chronic uh, conditions like IDS, um, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, things like that. Um, Practicing mindfulness can also help um, kind of what I think of as performance or flow, right? Um, again, um, being able to kind of ground ourselves into the here and now or the present moment, uh, present moment, excuse me, can afford us to improve things like our attention, kind of our working memory. It can help enhance or increase things like our motivation, our drive, um, our ability to learn. Um, it also kind of enhances and promotes emotional regulation. Obviously, we're gonna kind of talk a little bit more about that. And then it also can kind of help us with, um, you know, problem solving and decision-making. Um, and so just, you know, examples of that is if we're not kind of getting hooked and over overwhelmed or hijacked by kind of our emotional brain, it can allow us to maybe make more thoughtful, mindful, more intentional, maybe kind of decisions rather than emotional ones, right? Um, um, also, too, uh, research kind of shows that um, kind of overwhelmingly that um, mindfulness can help um, with increase or promote emotional health and well-being. Uh, well-being, yes. Um, certainly, um, practicing mindfulness we know can kind of help lower uh, stress hormones that are maybe released in our bodies, um, and thereby kind of increasing um, a sense of maybe relaxation and also self-acceptance. Um, it can help us combat and maybe reduce kind of negative self-talk or negative thinking um, while also kind of increasing, again, like I said, the sense of kind of self-acceptance, kind of accepting kind of who we are as we experience ourselves kind of just in that moment, right? No more, no less, just as it is. Um, also too, uh, research shows that people that practice mindfulness can increase a sense of feeling connection or connectedness with others. And then also kind of uh, reduce feelings of things like loneliness, isolation, um, so those are just, again, just a couple examples of kind of the many kind of health benefits, like I said, body, mind, and spirit, uh, the benefit um, that mindfulness can kind of afford us as we practice it. So um, before we kind of move forward, uh, just any other kind of thoughts, questions? Um, no questions that I see. Um, all right. With your view, do you want the PowerPoint over the whole screen? Because we just see the view where it's the next slides on the left. So I just wasn't sure if you want like the whole screen with the PowerPoint or not. Oh, you know what? That would no probably question. be better. Um, oh, sure, no we question. can do that. Um, thank I'm you just for letting me sure. know that. Oh, no worries. I thought I let you know in the beginning, but then I realized I was muted. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, no you know, as much tech oh, no, technology. We can it. Yeah. So I think if we do that, I'm going to just pause here and then I'm assuming this is probably the best way to do that. So let Perfect. me see if we can yeah. get where we're going here. Great. And no open questions right now. Thank you, Stacey. Right. Perfect. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Let's kind of get where we're going here. Okay. So um, we kind of talked a little bit about kind of what it is. We kind of talked a little bit about how it can benefit, you know, kind of body, mind, and spirit, right? And so really kind of really the next, uh, you know, kind of thought would be how do we actually practice this, right? And so I wanted to um, kind of talk a little bit about kind of ways of maybe introducing this to, to clients, certainly. And then I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to kind of experience this kind of together. So. Um, when we talk about kind of practicing mindfulness, whether it is something that you're interested in, maybe kind of, like I said, trying out for yourself, or whether this is, you know, something that you'd like to maybe incorporate or introduce to clients, um, 
first off, there are many, 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 many ways to kind of practice mindfulness. So what you see kind of in front of you here is just kind of some of the basics. Um, but there's ways of practicing mindfulness that involves moving one's body. So there's not sort of one right way to do this. What I want to kind of share with you today are just maybe some of, some of the basics, right? Some of the essentials. Um, and certainly when I um, introduce um, kind of this concept to clients, um, I usually like to talk a little bit like I did with you today about kind of what it is, its benefits. And then I really think that sometimes if you can experience something like this, it's, it's a whole lot more impactful or meaningful than just, you know, kind of hearing about it. So I will usually kind of, you know, kind of walk my clients through kind of some of these, these steps and then we'll get a chance to actually see what it feels like. So first and foremost, um, the idea is if you um, are looking to kind of introduce or practice mindfulness into your practice, um, you wanna make sure to tell clients um, to be able to find a space where they're able to sit and maybe be quiet or maybe calm for kind of a, a few moments where they can just sit and maybe be still, right? Um, when introducing this maybe for the first time, it is okay and probably helpful to set a time limit and really truly less is more. Um, so the idea of sitting for like 10 or 15 minutes seems like that might be easy to do, but it can be really challenging. And just like any other, you know, kind of practice or skill that we build, we want to kind of start um, and kind of build um, over time. So research even kind of shows that if we're able to sit um, and kind of practice mindfulness, kind of focusing on our breath for as little as even a minute a day, um, that that can help us kind of experience some of those health benefits and some of those um, kind of psychological benefits I just kind of mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So even if it's just sitting for a moment, that is really good enough. Um, and basically the practice is really kind of starting with being able to kind of observe and notice what is happening, you know, kind of in your body, um, observing maybe any thoughts you may be experiencing in the moment, any emotional reactions and certainly any bodily sensations kind of just as they are. And as you start to do this, what we want to try to do is start to kind of focus our awareness or center our attention just on our breath. Um, we don't have to change the quality of our breathing, but the idea of being able just to kind of help kind of anchor or draw our attention onto the breath is really kind of, kind of what really you know, mindfulness is and, and a great place to start. Um, what I always tell clients inevitably, um, our brains were built to produce thoughts and our brains produce thoughts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. It never stops. So when we talk about introducing the concept of mindfulness, it's really helpful and important to be able to kind of remind clients or even yourself that um, our minds are gonna wander. The goal of mindfulness is not to try to get to control or stop your brain from doing something. Um, what we really wanna do is kind of when we notice that our mind maybe has wandered from our breath because inevitably it will, is to be able to kind of gently and quietly um, and compassionately be able just to kind of return our attention kind of back to our breath. And when we do that, we're actually practicing mindfulness. Um, I know I say this, you know, the idea is to be kind and gentle with yourself when you experience that wandering. Um, kind of what I usually say is we want to accept it, uh, accept kind of what it is and be able to even greet that with stillness. Um, and then finally, as we kind of round out this practice, you know, the idea would be to maybe kind of close with kindness. So the idea would be to maybe, again, just kind of as you're closing out, just be able to take a moment, once again, kind of reconnect and maybe observe kind of what your thoughts, maybe bodily sensations, maybe even emotions, maybe uh, what you may be experiencing in that moment, um, and just kind of accept kind of what is. And what we inevitably also find is as we do this, what we can find is just through that stillness that our very own kind of thoughts and feelings and even bodily sensations bodily sensations, excuse me, can start to kind of shift and change even on their own. And that's really kind of powerful. And so um, this is how we practice mindfulness. So what I wanted to do now, um, it is Friday. Um, I was hoping to have you all actually kind of uh, get a chance to experience this kind of firsthand. And so I've kind of selected um, a grounding or a mindfulness exercise called Leaves on a Stream. Um, those of you that may have some familiarity or practice ACT may be familiar kind of with this exercise and that's wonderful. 
Um, I selected it because I think it's really, really helpful. Um, a couple of things to note, this exercise is gonna last about eight and a half minutes or so. So what I'd like for you to do, just like we talked about is to find yourself in a comfortable position. Um, if it helps to maybe kind of uh, place your feet kind of firmly on the floor, if you're seated upright in the chair, just so you can maybe feel kind of the weight and the support of the earth beneath your feet. Um, and then maybe we'll kind of talk about kind of what your experience is like kind of on the other side. Enjoy. You may have to share your sound, Stacy. Oh, okay. Sorry, at the very top, um, it's usually at the very top right, I believe. Um, the top right, top right. The last thing. Did you find it? Not yet. I, I might have to. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, when you say go on to the top right. Um... I believe so. I'm not sharing mine, so I'm trying to like remember where it is um yeah. on Sorry, the actual everybody. zoom one on the zoom screen it should um top right yeah it should be the little dots there if yep you click on those so it says oh. optimize for video clip uh let's see crud um if if not, I I can actually I can adjust. It's not a problem. Um, no, it should be there. It's it's uh. Let me see. Let me see. I'm gonna stop yours really quick. Mm -hmm. Share mine just so I can see where it's at. Okay. Um. Let's see. How do you do that? Share. Okay, so on mine, it's all the way to the right here under more. Do you have a more option? Let me see, let me, um, let me expand the screen a little bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing mine again. I don't think that I Let me, do. you know what, just a minute here, actually. Sorry, sorry everybody for this little. Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves for this brief interview. Just gonna say, let me try this. I'm gonna, okay, I'm sharing mine, and maybe that will do it. So I'm gonna sharing mine, and hopefully this will work. So, okay, maybe try it again, and let's see. Hopefully that was the answer. Okay, if not, I have a way to to do this manually as well. Okay. So. And it should let you share again too. Okay. I No, we can't hear it yet. I think you have to reshare your screen again. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, all right. Let's try this again.
No, but it's still not working. I don't, is it playing? Yeah, I don't know why. I'm sorry about that. It's just not. That's okay. Yeah, I, I thought maybe if I shared my sound, it would work. That's Everyone okay. says that there should be a button in the upper right to share sound. Um, so I don't know. That's okay. I'll tell you what, um, I don't want the technology to hold us up. So I have a way to do this manually. So if you all Ooh, don't okay, mind, perfect. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And um, can everybody hear, everybody can still hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, then let's just go with plan B. I apologize, everybody. I really kind of thought I had the technology down. So appreciate your patience with me today. It's always, there's always something with our technology. So there's no worries. Yeah. All right. Um, give me one moment. I just need to find the exercise here. second I'm just trying to find what I need I just need to find the exercise, the script in the book that I have here. So um, it's just taking me a little bit longer than what I thought. So Thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, let's try this one more time. Um, so what I'm going to have everybody do is just to start uh, by getting centered and begin to focus your attention on your breath. If it helps to close your eyes, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, if it helps to pick um, a focal point just to focus your attention, Please do so. I'm going to just have you start. I just notice the gentle rising and falling of your chest and belly. And if it helps to place one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly, please do so. There's no need to control your breathing in any way. Simply let the breath breathe itself. Again, allow your eyes to close gently. Continue to notice the natural rhythm, rhythm that your breath makes and your body makes with each in-breath and out-breath. In-breath. And out breath. And 
And as you continue to focus on your breath, imagine you are sitting next to a small stream on a warm autumn day. As you gaze at the stream, you may start to notice a large number of leaves of all colors and shapes and sizes drifting along, each at its own pace, one by one in a slowly moving current. Just allow yourself to simply be here for just a moment, watching. And when you're ready, gradually bring your awareness to what may be going on inside of you. And as you do, gently notice and label each experience that shows up. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, desires, even impulses. And simply pay attention to what's happening in your mind and body and then label what's going on. Perhaps one of those thoughts is I don't have time for this and that's okay. As the thoughts and feelings, sensations, desires, or impulses come along into your mind, notice them and gently place them one by one on each large leaf passing by. Observe as each leaf comes closer to you and then watch as it slowly moves away, drifting along as it carries the contents of your mind and body out of sight downstream. Return gazing to the stream, waiting for the next leaf to float by. Continue placing each thought, feeling, memory, or impulse on its own large leaf. Watch each one as you let them simply float away downstream. When you're ready, simply begin to widen your attention to take in the sounds around you. And then when you're ready, simply open your eyes and make the intention to bring gentle allowing 
and self-acceptance to the rest of your day. And if it helps to follow my voice, bringing yourself back to this time and this place, please do so. So curious, what was that like for you? Um, anyone willing or interested in sharing kind of maybe thoughts or reactions or their experience? Good. Um, I think Adi said, thank you, so relaxing. Good. Um, yeah, that's kind of, um, I think, yep. Uh, great feedback. So again, kind of, uh, kind of what I'm hearing you say is kind of calming. Um, Sandra mentions, great, yep. Great way to recenter, absolutely. Um, perfect. Um, lovely break. Excellent. Thank you. You guys are a great audience. Um, but that's actually kind of, you know, what mindfulness does, right? Um, it's really intended to be able to help us kind of maybe recenter. Oh yeah. Oh, great, great feedback. Um, lots of comments. Perfect. So Nancy mentioned feeling very focused, uh, relaxation, but yep. Perfect. Um, great feedback. Yeah. Very freeing. Um, let's see, a couple of people said found it challenging at first, uh, but then I was able to engage as it went on. Excellent, that's exactly right. Um, I think Nancy had said very focused relaxation, um, conversation and TV show in the background. We can take care of that. Um, I noticed self judgment and racing thoughts on some struggle, also relaxed once I could let go of the judgment. Perfect. Um, and a um, couple well, people mentioned they realized um, how much I was thinking about doing this with clients already and kind of let the thoughts float, helped you to come back to yourself. Excellent. Grounding, refreshing. Good. Excellent. Um, excellent. So, and so what I was going to say, great feedback. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm glad that this was really kind of helpful. Um, I'm going to. Um, Yes, I uh, love the visual of the leaf as some people kind of struggle with breath work. Exactly, it's part of the reason why I wanted to kind of share this exercise. Sometimes imagery, guided imagery can be really, really helpful for people. Um, thank you for that feedback. And I think Bernadette said, you know, peaceful. Um, loved being able to practice the exercise, kind of very detailed and grounding. Absolutely, thank you, Cameron. Um, yeah, so it sounds like, um, and this is kind of I think what we can kind of expect when we kind of introduce um, you know, this, this um, maybe technique or this kind of um, practice to our, our, our clients is that it can be challenging at first. Um, and so, um, but the idea of being able to kind of even greet with what we're experiencing with some acceptance and some gentle allowing is really, really key. Um, I am going to really quickly before we get rolling, see if I can um, kind of put the presentation Somebody said they almost went to sleep. Excellent. Um, excellent. Yeah. Oh, and so Denise actually mentioned that um, she's actually even used this um, with clients in the past. Uh, Teresa mentioned, yep, this would be really valuable for trauma clients. Absolutely. I was going to kind of talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the feedback, everybody. Um, Stacy, there was one question. Um, someone mm -hmm. asked, how would you explain how mindfulness differs from meditation or is meditation a form of mindfulness? And yeah, then I know you said you were gonna put your presentation back, so forget. I, I am, I'm gonna do that first before I forget because I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do it. My mind is a, um, let me see. So, um, no, sorry gang, sorry, hold on a second. Um, so I think as I try to figure out kind of what, what button I need to push, um, so mindfulness and meditation, um, do the same, right? So what we think of, I think of mindfulness as a building block of meditation, um, but essentially, um, they function very, very similarly, very, very similarly. Um, one second. 
There we go. Okay. Um, oh no, what did I just do? Hold on a second. I'm so sorry. I pressed the wrong button. Oh my God. Sorry. Um, let me try this one more time. I think if you just go down there where it says from current slide, um, right under up in the left a little bit. From, oh, from current slide, fair enough. Yeah, I okay. think usually that works. It, it should, I'm really sorry. Oh um, gosh, no worries. I've had, I believe me, I learned all this because I, Yep. So one of the things I probably didn't mention everybody, this is my first actual webinar where I'm actually kind of presenting via webinar. So this is a great learning experience for me. You're doing um, awesome. Thank you. So um, question. So yeah, there, um, what we think of as kind of mindfulness is kind of a building block of meditation. And so um, if it helps you to think of them as kind of very similar, they, they, there's hardly any daylight that separates the two. Um, what, what, what I like about um, kind of referencing mindfulness is that, you know, mindfulness doesn't have to necessarily involve, um, you know, kind of sitting, you know, seated and, and kind of what we think of the traditional kind of trappings of kind of practicing kind of meditation, right? This is something that can be done um, in small units of time. It can be done really anywhere. That's not unlike kind of meditation. Um, but I think that it's um, for some people, um, you know, this can be done in so many different kind of facets and ways, um, you know, very similar to, to meditation. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do next is kind of talk a little bit about um, how we can maybe go about um, kind of incorporating um, kind of this practice into, um, into clinical practice, right? And so just for the time that we have allotted today, um, we could probably talk about this for hours and hours and hours. I was really going to kind of concentrate our conversation, our discussion on, on how we could maybe incorporate um, mindfulness and managing, um, you know, two pretty common conditions that we probably see um, is, you know, helping folks kind of address issues of anxiety and depression. Um, okay. So um, I was going to also just ask kind of the, the group, um, does anybody... Um, currently kind of use or have found ways to kind of integrate mindfulness into um, into their, their current practice? I know it's a couple of people said on the slide, is there anyone that's willing to maybe share that feedback? And you're welcome to put any kind of thoughts or feedback in the chat if you have. Okay. Um, so when we talk about kind of finding ways of being able to use um, mindfulness to kind of help manage anxiety, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, when we think about, you know, kind of what drives anxiety, right? Um, we kind of talk about how oftentimes um, we can experience things like kind of worrisome thinking or excessive worry or even kind of negative thinking, right? So while that may not be the cause of anxiety, it certainly is a component. And so this idea, just like we just experienced a few minutes ago of being able to kind of um, sit with, and be with kind of our thoughts without having to kind of react directly upon them is a very powerful way that we can kind of um, inform and teach and show and help members kind of respond to that worrisome thinking or that negative thinking in a very, very different way. Um, when I took, uh, when I did the, uh, took my first Kind of training and how to practice and incorporate mindfulness into clinical practice. I had a wonderful, uh, wonderful presenter um, and was kind of talking about the concepts. And this is something that he had shared that really kind of stuck with me. And kind of all these years later, it's just something that really helped kind of crystallize kind of where and how um, the usefulness of this practice. And what he had said was, you know, not every thought that we think is a fact. And when I heard that, it really kind of opened my mind quite a bit. And so the idea of being able to kind of teach and inform um, and help, you know, clients see that, you know, again, um, what our brain does is it produces thoughts seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. It affords us the opportunity not to have to react and expect or assume that every thought that we think um, is one that requires action, but also is a fact, right? 
Um, and so I just find that to be really, really helpful. And then also, um, you know, this idea of being able to kind of greet what we may be experiencing, kind of bodily sensations, maybe thoughts or feelings um, with some awareness and some kind of self-acceptance um, also um, kind of helps us to kind of develop kind of this concept of observer. And if any of you kind of practice or have studied or know a little bit about acceptance and commitment therapy, that's a really big, you know, kind of concept or component um, in that kind of treatment. And so um, the way that I kind of think about it and the way that I like to kind of kind of frame this for clients a lot of times is when we can kind of sit and be still with kind of what we're maybe experiencing, um, it gives us kind of that space, as I mentioned, to be able to look at maybe what we're thinking and, and, and be able to maybe decide which of those thoughts we may want to choose to maybe respond to and maybe take action upon versus the ones that maybe we just kind of place on that leaf and just kind of, you know, kind of let kind of float by and kind of let go. Um, and I think that that can be a very empowering way to help people kind of, you know, discern, um, again, what am I going to act on? And if, if I have a greater ability to act with some intention, that maybe affords me not to have to kind of respond to some of that negative self-talk that may be running around in my brain all the time. Um, so that's kind of one way I think that mindfulness practice can be really helpful in managing anxiety, right? Um, I also think that somebody had mentioned this would be really helpful in, in helping people address, you know, issues of trauma, and the answer is absolutely. Um, this can also very much be used kind of as an in-the-moment technique to kind of help kind of counteract or combat um, kind of our body's kind of flight or fight response or when the stress response is triggered. Um, I had... Um, I had a, an example um, of a client that I was that was coming in to see me for an initial visit or a first session. So this really would have been a time for me to, you know, do an assessment. And she'd never been in treatment before, and she came in and was visibly, you can tell, very kind of stressed and very anxious. And as I was getting started to do my assessment, she essentially went into a full panic attack, which again, not not surprising. Um, but I hadn't even had the pleasure of being able to, you know, kind of know any of her history. So kind of what I thought to do in the moment was to be able to kind of just um, guide her um, to have her just become aware of her breathing as rapid and maybe as shallow as it was, and just kind of uh, through kind of helping her kind of engage with her breath and just kind of like we just did through the exercise, being able to kind of focus her awareness on what may be happening in her body um, and being able to kind of um, use kind of that mindfulness approach um, in the span of a couple minutes, it really afforded her to be able to kind of ground herself and kind of center herself, like many of you kind of experienced from that exercise, enough to be able to kind of um, kind of recompose herself so that we were actually able to at least kind of do the assessment. And so, um, so kind of what we know about our mind and what we know about the brain is that when we move into that, you know, our body stress response gets triggered and we move into that fight or flight response, you know, our sympathetic nervous system is what's activated. And so... Um, one of the ways that I think mindfulness can, can be used to counteract that is that, as you saw, as we kind of slow our breathing and as we elongate our breathing and as we kind of just kind of ground ourselves into the now through our breath, what that does is it actually activates our body's parasympathetic nervous system, which is essentially kind of our relaxation response, right? Um, the other thing that we do know, and it sounds like many of you kind of experienced it kind of firsthand with the exercise, is that our body will always follow our breath. And so it's not surprising that maybe a few minutes into that exercise, many of you may have noticed that your shoulders may have kind of felt a little bit softer, or maybe less tension in your jawline. Um, your breathing may have kind of slowed and thereby your heart rate maybe would, would have slowed as well. And that's kind of what happens. So when we kind of slow our breath, we elongate our breath and kind of ground ourselves into the present moment, um, what that affords our body to do is that our heart rate will slow um, the rate in which we may be experiencing our thoughts may start to slow as well. Um, and so again, kind of practicing kind of mindfulness kind of right in the moment can be able to help, you know, kind of provide folks with that grounding, that grounding technique. Um, in addition, um, and also very helpful and valuable in, in helping people that may be triggered if they're experiencing kind of, you know, post-traumatic stress or kind of trauma, this is a, a really helpful way to be able to kind of bring them back kind of into the present. Um, the other thing, too, is that if we are kind of focusing on our breath, it can't help but bring us into the present moment, right? And so thereby, 
we can't be maybe worrying about possible futures or kind of ruminating or getting stuck in maybe kind of, you know, past kind of memories or thoughts. So it, it allows us to kind of fully kind of be present. Um, in addition to kind of practicing it kind of in session. So sometimes it's like I've, I've done this if, if folks have been actually really triggered and just to be able to kind of ground them into the present moment. Um, but also I can maybe introduce this. I have introduced it, um, I've demonstrated it. Um, and it, a lot of times if folks can kind of get exposure to kind of a new skill, we kind of practice it, you know, kind of in session um, that allows them to kind of feel and experience kind of some of the benefits. And then um, it can also be used. And I oftentimes will prescribe it as, as homework, um, homework or as a behavioral exper uh, experiment, right? So um, what we probably want to do is when we introduce a skill like this, we want, you know, to kind of get some buy-in. So if somebody experiences and sees and feels how positive it is, they may be more inclined or more likely to kind of practice it on their own. And so I'll kind of frame it just like that. So I might encourage people to you know, maybe consider um, as a behavioral experiment, maybe you sit for maybe a moment, maybe you do this, you know, maybe as you're waking up in the morning, maybe you do it around bedtime, maybe you pick one other time, uh, maybe you do it two or three times in between, you know, sessions. And then just like you would with any other behavior experiment, just kind of encourage them to kind of maybe track their experience, track their thoughts. What did it do? Did their anxiety get intense? Uh, did it intensify? Did it level off? Did it decrease? Um, again, and kind of going through and asking them just to jot down what bodily sensation changes did they notice or not. And then you can kind of come back in subsequent sessions and really kind of talk about, um, you know, uh, it, what it did. And oftentimes what I find is when clients do that, they can come back and they're like, wow, you know, I, I tried this before going into a really hectic meeting or I tried this before I went in to go discipline my kiddo. And I noticed that it really helped me not, you know, fly off the handle or get too nervous or kind of, you know, stumble over myself. So um, again, it's definitely something that can be done in session, um, but also it can be uh, prescribed certainly as homework or as a, as a behavioral um, experiment. Um, I thought maybe I'd just kind of, you know, kind of um, just check in. Anyone have any kind of maybe thoughts, maybe kind of questions, uh, reactions to hearing that? Sorry, I'm looking for this. Okay. Um, if any thoughts come up, just uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Debbie will help me out and I'll be happy to kind of answer any, any questions that come up about that. So um, also too, um, in addition to um, kind of practicing um, and using mindfulness to address um, anxiety, um, like I said, you know, generalized anxiety, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress, all that good stuff. Um, mindfulness can also be very, very helpful and helping people self-manage, um, you know, uh, symptoms of depression too. So uh, certainly, uh, what cognitive behavioral uh, theory kind of teaches us is we know that there is a relationship that exists between uh, kind of what we think, kind of our mood, right, and our behavior. And so, um, and any of those of you that kind of practice CBT are familiar with it. So that's kind of an important kind of uh, trifecta, right? So when we talk about practicing mindfulness what it can do is it also affords us kind of the opportunity to sort of see firsthand. Um, again, it's that idea of creating space between kind of what we're thinking, maybe how we're feeling, any bodily sensations that we may be experiencing. And it allows us to start to kind of recognize that we are not kind of a, the sum of our parts, right? We are not just um, kind of the results of kind of what our thoughts and our feelings are. So in some ways, it really helps us to kind of counteract or challenge things like cognitive distortions or negative self-talk that often kind of corresponds, um, you know, with depression, right? Um, I also find that um, when we practice kind of mindfulness, um, it can be used um, as a way to uh, kind of promote uh, maybe new adaptive kind of behavior or when we think about behavior activation, right? So this idea, well, if I, you know, if I'm not the sum of the thoughts that I have, and if I have to experience maybe some unpleasant or intense thoughts, but I can greet that with stillness, and I can maybe choose to respond to the thoughts that are a little bit more neutral or self-affirming, um, then that really kind of helps to change my reality, doesn't it? And it really helps me to see myself in a, in a maybe new and different way. And I think when we're able to do that, it helps us to be able to maybe talk about kind of other ways of kind of activating some behavior change, right? So if the idea is 
I maybe feel in the moment that I have no motivation or I'm super tired, um, I can acknowledge that. And possibly I might still be able to maybe start to engage in some kind of you know, value added behaviors, or maybe I can recognize that I'm sort of you know, amotivational, but at the same time, if I get up and maybe move my body a little bit, that maybe um, that will kind of start to kind of affect the change in how I feel, right? So this is a, it's a way to be able to kind of create kind of an, uh, an opening for um, using some other tools that we may have in our toolkits like behavior activation and things like that. Um, as we've been kind of talking about, I do think kind of uh, mindfulness teaches things like uh, kind of self-regulation, right? It's a way to be able to help us kind of respond to um, affect uh, dysregulation in a very different way. Um, we don't have to get kind of swooped up and kind of overwhelmed by kind of all the uh, thoughts, maybe reactions or emotions that we may be feeling inside. So it, it also thereby gives us an opportunity in a way and a means to feel like we have some skills to be able to kind of respond to and affect a change kind of in our, in our mood, right? And then also um, when we think about um, some, of, uh, some of the other benefits, um, what mindfulness can kind of uh, provide us is it absolutely helps us to build things like resistance or build things, uh, when we think about, um, excuse me, resilience um, or kind of build things like psychological kind of flexibility so again, this idea is um, if we can kind of keep and remain ourselves maybe present, regardless of maybe the intensity of the thoughts um, or maybe kind of the, unpleasant of maybe the unpleasantness of maybe thoughts or emotions or bodily sensations we may be experiencing and just kind of accept them as they are, knowing that they in turn may kind of shift and change on their own, um, that also kind of affords us, again, that that space or that ability then to make some conscious, more intentional maybe decisions about um, what behaviors we may choose to maybe engage in, right? It may allow for us to be able to make some choices and in, in engaging in maybe some more kind of you know, value-based kind of behaviors. And again, um, like I mentioned before, if any of you are kind of familiar with or have practiced um, acceptance and commitment therapy, so much of what that therapy is about is helping um, people maybe kind of um, behave in ways that are reflective of kind of what they value. And when we, what we know is that when we engage in behaviors that are kind of um, in step or in alignment with what we value, that tends to kind of uh, create a sense of kind of meaning and purpose in our lives. And so um, again, mindfulness is kind of a tool to kind of help us start to kind of achieve that and, and build that um, resilience. Um, uh, maybe, any kind of thoughts or comments? Um, no questions. Okay. Um, yeah, someone said, uh, thank you for, um, thank you in that slowing our thoughts is important. Yep. Yep. And, and also too, I think that, you know, oftentimes, you know, um, when, um, I think when clients kind of come in and are really kind of suffering, right, that they are looking for a way to kind of find relief. And while there isn't any magic bullets, right, um, this is just a way to be able to kind of help ease kind of some of that suffering, right? And we'll kind of talk a little, a little bit about that, um, a little bit more about that. Um, right. So um, I would hardly call these conclusions, but maybe just some final thoughts or some takeaways, right? Um, if you're thinking about, you know, kind of starting to kind of incorporate, you know, kind of mindfulness as a skill or practice into your own lifestyle, or whether you're thinking about how I might do that with some of my clients, right? I think first and foremost, um, what I want, um, you know, us to kind of hear and recognize is that mindfulness absolutely is a skill, right? Um, kind of the more we practice, the greater the benefit or the greater effectiveness kind of it serves us as a skill. Um, when I um, introduce this to clients, I use kind of uh, what I call the learning to drive metaphor. And I find metaphors to be really, really helpful, I think, in, in, in working with clients. And, and what I usually kind of explain is that I usually ask people to think back to maybe the first time they got behind the wheel of a car um, and, you know, ask them, you know, how did that feel? Uh, more often than not, people say, I was terrified, I had no idea how to work this you know, big piece of machinery and, and that kind of thing. And so, so we talk about that, right? And so we talk about, you know, we took driver's ed, um, we practice, we get a learner's permit, and then we still drive for an entire year. 
And then by the time um, hopefully we get our driver's license and even after we've been driving with enough, you know, maybe consistency that we start to kind of um, that skill get so ingrained in what we in, in, in um, what we do as we as we create greater and greater efficiency in doing it and greater greater proficiency in doing it um, that we don't think so much about the mechanics anymore we just kind of you know we get into the car we close the door we you know it, you know get the key going and we're off and running and we don't really think about you know again kind of that fear that um, anxiety that we had maybe the first time we got behind the wheel of the car um, Practicing mindfulness is kind of like that. You know, the greater the benefits are really kind of with the consistency itself of the practice. Um, and the more we do it, the more beneficial, you know, it, it is. Um, it is also, um, again, it's a practice, it's a discipline, it's a skill. Um, you know, if we were to talk about a way and a means of kind of creating it as kind of a daily practice, um, you know, what it could look like. Um, again, we kind of talked about just kind of finding a quiet place to be able to kind of find yourself where you have a moment where you can just kind of sit and, and be, right? Um, the idea when we practice mindfulness, it, it affords us the ability to, you know, stop, right? Breathe, maybe bring some awareness to kind of our breath, right? Um, reflect or maybe kind of focus or observe uh, what is happening in the moment, you know, our bodily sensations, any emotional reactions we, we may be having in the moment, um, any corresponding thoughts. And we, we sit with it, right? We greet it with maybe some stillness. Um, we maybe greet it with some loving kindness or even some compassion, uh, certainly not judgment. And then again, in that space, it, it allows us to see that sometimes those thoughts, bodily sensations, um, feelings may shift and change um, on their own and thereby we may not have to do anything about them um, but it also affords us the ability to make some greater kind of intentional or thoughtful decisions about which of these maybe thoughts or reactions do I want to consciously respond to versus the ones I'm going to maybe kind of let go of um, and I think again if, if we have the ability to pick and choose the affirming thoughts that we think versus maybe letting the negative ones go that can really kind of change, you know, our, our realities, right? Um, again, we talked about this kind of at the beginning of our time together. Um, so certainly we're talking about the psychological benefits and, and helping us kind of help our clients. Um, but this really truly is a practice or a discipline or a skill that helps us, it benefits both mind and body. Um, and so um, it can kind of help us uh, kind of ground ourselves if we're um, in the midst of having, you know, really big kind of uh, bodily, you know, sensations or triggers, right? If we're kind of struggling with trauma. Um, so again, it's a, it benefits both mind and body. Um, we talked a little bit about, again, um, how it can be an effective tool or means to help foster um, an adaptive way of helping people cope with anxiety and depression. Um, I, I didn't, um, I, I wanted to mention too, um, it's not only for depression and anxiety. Um, I think any condition um, that, that our clients may experience that involves, you know, affect dysregulation um, is uh, mindfulness can be a, a very, very powerful and effective tool of helping us combat that. So certainly um, for those of you that have maybe practiced or familiar with, and I mentioned, you know, ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy, but also those of you that may have some familiarity in practicing DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy, mindfulness is one of the core um, skills that is taught in that therapy to kind of help people that struggle with affect dysregulation to be able to um, kind of respond maybe differently and uh, thereby help to develop more um, effective and adaptive kind of coping strategies. Um, as I mentioned before, this can be an effective tool of helping people manage, you know, things like panic disorder, um, trauma, right, post-traumatic stress, things like that. Um, as far as kind of how you might introduce this uh, concept or practice to clients in your practice, again, it's something that it could be uh, done in the form of a demonstration. It can be done in session. Um, it can also be done or assigned as homework. Um, so it would be something that you could maybe offer or prescribe, as I mentioned before, as a um, behavioral experiment. Um, and I have found that, like I said, people find uh, to be really helpful and useful to be able to take maybe some of these skills and techniques and be able to apply them 
into their everyday everyday world um, to be able to kind of you know, develop a sense of maybe mastery or a sense of um, 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 hope or um, uh, empowerment that like, hey, I am finding something that I can do in the moment that allows for me to maybe dial down some of the intensity of you know, maybe the anxiety that I'm feeling in this moment so that I can still be able to kind of function and maybe do the things that I kind of need to do. And I think that's really, really empowering uh, for clients. Um, and so just, again, wanted to open it up. Um, I wondered if anyone had any you know, thoughts or comments. Um, there are a couple of questions there. I don't know if you see the questions or you want me to read them. If you could read them right now, I sure, can't quite sure. see them. Um, so the first one is, do you have any other recommendations or exercises to practice mindfulness? I'm going to be incorporating a mindfulness Monday into my group therapy practice. And that's from oh, Tasha. Awesome. Actually, I do. Um, so um, the the book that I um, um, I got, the Leaves on the Stream exercise, um, is actually a book called, and I think it's in the reference list, but it's called The Mindfulness and Acceptance Workbook for Anxiety. Um, it is, uh, was prepared by John Forsyth, PhD, and George Efert. So there are a number of scripts um, that you could use, um, um, kind of that are listed in the workbook that you can use and implement. Um, I know uh, when I was kind of preparing kind of uh, this presentation today, I actually went onto YouTube to sort of see kind of what was available. And there are a number of kind of mindfulness um, uh, exercises that are a video with sound recording that you could use. Um, and then another one that um, uh, I, I wanted to just really quickly kind of touch on. Um, so we talked about kind of using kind of our breath as kind of that, you know, that, uh, that point of reference or that point of awareness to be able to kind of recenter or focus. Another um, exercise that I do quite a bit with clients, especially folks that may have a hard time sitting still for a couple minutes at a time, um, there's an exercise called five senses. And you can actually find this on therapistaid.com if you're familiar with that. Um, it's called uh, five senses, like I mentioned. And so the idea is essentially the same. Um, you would kind of have somebody kind of focus on their breath. And as you have them focus on their breath, you maybe start to have them draw their awareness on each of their five senses. And you may start with having them focus on what they can see and maybe identify five things that somebody can maybe see in the moment. A um, couple of breaths, maybe have somebody then identify um, through their sense of touch, maybe four things that they can feel through their sense of touch. Um, come back to a couple of breaths, um, then identify three things that they may be able to use through their sense of hearing in the moment. Um, and then identify two things maybe they can smell kind of in that present moment. And then finally, um, you know, one item that maybe somebody can use for their sense of taste. So that also um, does take some practice. That's still a, a great um, mindfulness exercise. And it also can be done. Um, I've, I've done it with my son. Um, so it can be done really effectively with children. If any of you kind of work with or you know, work with children, um, they really get into that. Um, and that's also something for somebody that may have a hard time sitting and being still um, if it's hard for them to focus on their breath, that might be another uh, technique that allows them to be able to experience kind of what the benefits of this, but just using, like I said, their, their senses as kind of that, that um, um, point of attention or, or grounding. Really good question. I hope that helps. Um, let's see. The next one is, I have a client with intense intrusive thoughts. Can the client verbalize during mindfulness versus sitting in silence while listening to me guiding her focus and awareness? That is a really good question. Um, that is a great question. I have never practiced mindfulness in that way. Um, I would think that if you were to do something like that, um, my first question would be, um, what do you like? What do you think the benefit would be of having them? verbalize the in, the intrusive thought maybe versus this idea of being able to kind of use use maybe placing it on a leaf and watching it float by i don't think that that would be a, a negative but i'm just curious kind of um kind of what the advantage would be or what your thoughts would be about allowing them to maybe verbalize that um let's see the last one is can you use by oral 
Sound for Mindfulness Exercise. I hope I pronounced that right. B-I-A-U-R-A-L, Bioral Sound for Mindfulness. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with what bioral means. So if anyone can maybe clarify that, um, I'm, I'm assuming that would be maybe a, a, a focusing on a sound, um, if that's what that's referring to. I know some people use um, those singing oh, bowls. Someone said yeah. bi, binaural, B-I-N-A-U-R-A-L, binaural. I don't know. I still don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can. I, I'm not familiar with that term either. But if it's if it's a point of grounding, I mean, I think like I had just mentioned, um, the idea of being able to kind of bring somebody's awareness into the here and now. And so if there is a way to do that, so whether it's through a sound, um, you know, again, uh, my first thought might be a, the singing bowl uh, might be a way to do that. Um, so I don't think there's there's not a wrong way to do this, right? Um, and so I think you might want to kind of get creative, but certainly kind of the the intention um, and the practice would be to find a way to kind of bring somebody kind of into the present moment and whatever means are necessary to do that, but really then couple that with how do you kind of be present with what you're experiencing but greet it with stillness, right? Okay. I think that's kind of the that's kind of the the winning combination there. So if you do it through a sound or a noise, by all means, but it's the idea to be kind of grounded, right? Is probably kind of the important other part of that. Good, good question. Okay, yeah. Um, they said yes. It's it's the singing bowl. Mm -hmm. so I think yep. that's what you. Okay, cool. Yep, yep. That would that would be that would be great. Sometimes people will use. Um, when I say music, um, I mean, there's, there's no wrong way to do this. Um, I know there's uh, like uh, Steve Halperin um, was a psychologist that ended up kind of making, you know, uh, music to promote things like sleep. So I would imagine music could also be a very powerful tool that might, you know, ground somebody in the here and the now. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. I don't see any more. There's no more questions. Um, it looks like some people had some comments on the, the sound thing. So that was cool. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's okay. see here. I am going to, um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen here. There we go. Um, what? Awesome. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it, Stacy. Thank you so, so much for your presentation. It was sure. awesome and amazing. I always love these because I learn, I'm not a clinician, so I learned so much. Right. Um, sorry about that. I got that all weird. That's um, okay. No, that's okay. Um, if I could leave you all with, um, I just uh, wanted to maybe kind of just in final conclusion, um, just wanted to leave you with a quote. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, if you're familiar with him, he was a Buddhist priest a uh, wonderful kind of peace advocate who's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, but I really think for me, kind of this practice, I mean, if there's ways that we can be instilling hope, um, and like I said, a sense of kind of, um, kind of mastery for folks and being able to kind of help them self-manage some of what they're going through. I think this, this sums it up for me. So again, if we practice mindfulness, we always have a place to be when we are afraid. And I think so much, you know, when our members are kind of, our, excuse me, our clients are kind of seeking support and guidance, um, you know, from therapy, um, if there's ways that we can help to create an internal space where they know they can go, it's always with them, right, their breath, <laughs> they can always go to be able to help kind of ground when they need to, can really afford them um, a way to be able to experience kind of a much different way of living. So I just kind of wanted to leave you with that. Um, thank you all for your participation and your patience with me today with some of the technical difficulties. You were a wonderful audience. You asked some really great questions and I just appreciate sharing this time with you. Wonderful. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, thank you for everybody who attended. If you didn't see in the early, early chat, uh, I will get your CEU certificate sent out this afternoon. Uh, along with a PDF of the presentation. So that way, um, if you didn't get a note on something, you can look it up there. We are always happy to have you join us for our presentations. Our next one will be next month. So if you're not on our contact list, when I send you your certificate, uh, reply that you would like to be on that contact list.
And I hope that everyone has an amazing and an awesome weekend. And I am going to close it out then. Thank you.